Good evening, everybody. I am going to be talking to you tonight about the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. The Black Panther Party was started in Oakland, California in 1966, and not soon after that spread all across the country. And before its tenure ended, it had 42 chapters throughout the United States. But in addition to that, it also spread across the globe. And so there were also Panther chapters and affiliates in places like England and France and Germany, India, Israel. Uh, there are even affiliates in China. This is an image of the founder, Huey Newton, meeting with Chu Enlai, the Chinese premier, in 1970. Um, so in addition to being a global and national thing, it's also very local. I wonder how many of you knew that there was a Black Panther Party chapter right here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, this is the Fred Hamp Hampton People's Free Health Clinic that was on North Russell Avenue uh, back in the 1970s. And in fact, it didn't close until 1980 when OHSU took over the property. There was a Black Panther Party chapter also in Seattle, Washington that has a free health clinic that started in 69 and is still operating today. So uh, even though the name of the organization says has black in it, it had all kinds of supporters, Latinos, Asians, uh, certainly whites, Native Americans, and, and other people. So we have uh, these two guys, Huey Newton and, and Bobby Seale, who decide, they're, they're college students, that there are these problems in the black community that need to be addressed. And there are quite a few problems, uh, but one of the biggest problems is the brutality and murder that's going on in the community. As I said, the Black Panther Party was started in October of 1966. The 10 months before the organization started, seven black people were killed in the Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area, and they thought that they needed to do something about that. And so what they decided to do was to get cameras and tape recorders and weapons and follow the police. They called them police patrols. And what we see in the one year after the founding of the Black Panther Party organization, rather than seven people being killed, zero people are killed in the Bay Area. And there are also zero shootouts. There's not that much antagonism because what happens is the Black Panther Party follows the police through the community. They see them pull people over. They pull over as well, and they stand a, about 100 feet away. The law in California said you needed to be about 20 feet away, but they would stand about 100 feet away and yell, hey, sister, hey, brother, we're going to be watching this interaction. So if anything's hap happening, we're taking pictures and we're listening. And usually, nothing would happen. And in fact, I'm saying usually, almost always nothing would happen. Sometimes people would go to jail, but then the Panthers would go and break them out. I say break them out because Sometimes they didn't have the money, they would bribe the jailer, uh, and they would, he would let them out. So uh, that's how they started to gain recruits. But they were interested in much more than just uh, defending the community. They organized around something called the 10 Point Platform and Program. And what this did was to show people that there are issues that needed to be addressed, and rather than asking the government to address them, the Panthers decided they were going to do that themselves. And so they created employment programs. Um, they created housing programs. Uh, they built schools and organized schools as well for people. But they became known, of course, as people who were uh, well armed and looking to kill white people. They, they, all these Black men are just going to get up one day and go kill a bunch of white people. They're a bunch of black racists, and that's it. And that's kind of uh, our understanding of the Black Panther Party, that it was this organization filled with black men that just wanted to take over the government, and in their spare time, they would kill white people. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. The, the actual fact of the matter is the Black Panther Party was made up primarily of women. Most of the people in this organization were women. And by 1971, the majority of the leadership of the organization um, were actually women. And so that's a myth that uh, you shouldn't believe if you see it someplace. Uh, go back to that uh, black racism thing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of understanding on the part of lay people and on the part of my students, too, that the Panthers were these real big racists. And I want to prove to you tonight that they were not, because one of their signature programs was the Free Breakfast for Children program. And what they would do is go to grocery stores in their communities 
and ask these grocery store owners, usually wealthy people, usually white people, if they would donate milk and bread and cheese and meat and juice or money. And invariably, uh, these grocery store owners would say yes. Occasionally, they would say no. But usually they would say yes. And what we see all over the country are Black Panther Party free breakfast programs pop up. And by 1970, the Black Panther Party was serving 25,000 children every day free breakfast. And they were doing this because they had done some research and found that it was very difficult uh, to learn if you're hungry. And so they wanted to get the children food. And it was, again, these uh, well-to-do, often wealthy uh, white grocery store owners that actually funded these programs. And so it is highly unlikely that if the Panthers were actually these um, really racist people who were looking to kill white folks, that they would have funded their signature programs. Another really good example are the Black Panther Party free health clinics, also popped up all over the United States. Uh, they would go to these clinics, they would go to hospitals, and they would speak to the doctors the nurses, uh, the interns, the graduate students, and say, hey, we've got all these health problems in the black community. We can't actually afford to go to a doctor. Would you come and serve these people? And again, they almost always said yes. And so in dozens of cities throughout the United States, you would see free health clinics pop up. But what you'd see is white people are the folks who are giving the money, providing the supplies, giving the training for Panthers to do it, and also going into the communities and doing it themselves. And so it just is not likely that they were people who were interested in killing white people uh, and, and th that they were anti-white. So the question is, why is it that we have this impression, this very negative impression of the Black Panther Party? Why is it that we think these bad things about the Black Panther Party? Well, I submit to you that um, there was a concerted effort on the part of the federal government to paint this picture of the Black Panther Party. And it was led by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, in 1968, he described the Black Panther Party as the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. Now, there are 280 million people in the United States, and there are 4,000 Panthers. Um, and by 1967, even though I showed you the image with the gun, by 1967, they don't carry guns anymore because it's against the law in most states. Uh, they quickly passed laws saying you can't do that anymore. Uh, so J. Edgar Hoover decided he was going to create a program, it was called the Counterintelligence Program, that would attack the Black Panther Party. He attacked a lot of other groups too, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality. Quality, Martin Luther King's SCLC, any group that sought to change the status quo, he would attack. But because the Black Panther Party was this anti-racist organization and didn't see white people as the problem, they got attacked the most. There were 295 COINTEL Pro operations, 233 of those were directed at the Black Panther Party. Uh, and you can see here on the screen what the kinds of things that they were doing. And I have a little newspaper clipping here just to uh, show you how we found this out. A group of white people decided that they were gonna go into the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania and steal some documents. They were sick and tired of their friends and neighbors uh, and family members being drafted and sent off to Vietnam. So they were gonna go and steal their paperwork so that they would, their number wouldn't come up. Well, when they got there, they found this stuff. And when they found that stuff, they sent it to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and CBS. And that's how we found out all this stuff. And later on, Senator Frank Church from Idaho did an investigation and found that, yeah, the, the FBI has actually been uh, messing with people. And, you know, sometimes they would just uh, infiltrate a group and cause a little trouble. But other times they would do extreme things like neutralize or kill an individual. I know it's hard to believe, but I have two examples to share with you. Uh, where that actually happened. In January of 1969, on the campus of UCLA in, in Los Angeles, two Black Panther Party members were actually executed. They were there having a discussion about uh, which organization's person was going to become the leader of the new Black Studies program being founded at UCLA. So you had the US organization on one side, which was led by a man named Ron Karanga. He actually created Kwanzaa, and you have the Black Panther Party on the other side. Uh, there were disagreements and a government agent actually created a bigger problem and shooting started. 
And right there in Campbell Hall on the campus of UCLA, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins are killed. Carter was the leader of the LA chapter and John Huggins was the Minister of Information. Now you say, well, that's horrible. Well, it is, but the two people who pulled the trigger were actually arrested, taken to court, and charged and sentenced to very long prison terms. And they were placed in San Quentin Prison, which is right there in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area next to Alcatraz Island. Well, in less than a year, they became the only two people who have ever escaped from San Quentin. So, go figure. Uh, <laughs> If you want another example, I think another very good example would be uh, in Chicago, Illinois, where Mark Clark and Fred Hampton suffered the same fate. Fred Hampton was very persuasive in bringing all types of people together. In Chicago, he organized wealthy white people, middle class white people, Latinos, Native Americans, Asian people. You've probably heard of the Rainbow Coalition. Um, Jesse Jackson eventually takes that over in the late 70s and early 1980s, but he creates this rainbow coalition. Well, that was too much for J. Edgar Hoover and the government, and so they decided to do something about him. And on December 4th, about 4.30 in the morning, 1969, the police, government agents, people from the state's attorney's office there in Illinois, burst into Fred Hampton's apartment and started spraying it with bullets. Uh, they wound up wounding about eight people and uh, we know this from the trial transcripts that, that takes place a little bit later. Uh, they sequester everybody in the kitchen, and these people testify in trial that they hear people in the back room where Fred is saying, is he dead? Is he going to make it? Is he still breathing? And later, about three seconds later, they hear two shots from a 45 automatic pistol, and they hear one person say, he's good and dead now. And that was the end of Fred Hampton. He's executed right there on the spot. Now in 1983, his family and Mark Clark's family were given $2 million, but that doesn't bring Fred back. I mean, they were able to achieve their goals, and you can see in this image that, that they were quite uh, happy with, um, with their accomplishments. So this is the reason we see so much negativity around the Black Panther Party, because they were making very serious inroads into getting people not to think about race, but to think about humanity. And it didn't just stop in the 1960s and 1970s. It's still going on today. Uh, the founder, I'm sure you've heard of the Black Lives Matter movement. The founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, Patricia, uh, Patrice Cullors, has been labeled a terrorist by um, people in the government and media pundits. And she is harassed to no end. And of course, all she's done is shed delight on what's happening in black communities across this country. Uh, she hasn't been violent, really hasn't even used any curse words, but now uh, she's being called a terrorist. And so you can see how these kinds of ideas get spread in the media. And it, we don't have to go that far afield. I myself ha have been um, labeled, uh, mislabeled, I should say, by my own, um, because of my own research, because of my perceived affiliation with the Black Panther Party. Now, the Black Panther Party actually went out of business by the time I was in the first grade, so I don't know how I had anything to do with it, but it did. Uh, but I have been detained about 26 times since this book came out. Typically, I get pulled over on the highway, and cop always asks me, you know why I stop you? And I say, yeah, I, I do know. Of course, I never say why, um, but I do know. And nothing ever happens. They just let me go. It's a kind of har harassment. Probably the worst harassment I experienced was back in 2007 when I was going through an airport in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, I'm on the plane, I get called off the plane. I get brought back to where I check my bags in. They say, is this your bag? I say, yep. Are these your books? I say, yeah, this is a, a copy of uh, the cover of my book. And he says, well, when we have a gun problem, we have to call the FBI. A gun problem? What, what is the problem? These, these are actually um, members of the Seattle chapter on the steps of Olympia, Washington, the capital in Olympia, Washington. But that's a gun problem. So the FBI shows up, questions me for four hours. I was actually, uh, now I, I have to defend them a little bit because I had a suitcase full of these. There's 26 of them, no clothes no toiletries, I had a one-way ticket to Iowa. I, I'd, uh, <laughs> I just bought this car on, the, on eBay and I was going to pick up my car and I'd had a book, uh, book signing and ran out of books 
and I was going to bring these books back to the people who gave me money to bring them back, but they didn't see it that way. So uh, I got a chance to meet my first FBI agent. Um, but after this, I get back to work. I come to find out that I've been labeled a fella. So I call the airport and say, hey, I didn't commit any crime. He says, well, we don't know what you're talking about. Call the U.S. Attorney's Office. I do. They don't know why I'm a felon, but they can look in their system and see I am. They said, you need to call um, airport police. Call airport police and say, we don't know why, but you are. You need to call the U.S. Attorney's Office. I'll call the U.S. Attorney's Office. They said, yep, says you're a felon right here, but we don't know where you committed this crime, you know, what court convicted you, but you are a felon. And so it took me almost three years, about, about two and a half years, to get this mark removed from my record. So these are the ways that people with influence and power and means can spread ideas that are not necessarily true. I'm certainly not a felon. Uh, six times since this happened, I've had a background check and I've always been hired and always been allowed to do whatever I want to do. Because, uh, so I'm pretty sure uh, the University of Oregon wouldn't have hired me if I was a <laughs> felon. I'd, I'd like to hope they wouldn't have anyway. Uh, so my question for you, are things getting better today? Are they getting better? Well, I, I hear you, I hear you, but I would, I would like to think that just because our TVs and our cell phones and our Twitter feeds focus on things that keep us uptight doesn't mean other good stuff is not going on. Uh, there are positive things happening in this country. There are positive things happening in this state. And in fact, there are very positive things happening at the University of Oregon. So I would submit to you that things are, in fact, getting better. For example, 90 miles south of here at the University of Oregon, um, the university has created a black studies program. Many of you probably never would have dreamed that would happen, right? Never would have imagined that would happen. Uh, the University of Oregon is hiring uh, more women, uh, more underrepresented people, more black people. They hired me, right? I think that's a positive development. Just a few weeks ago, the University of Oregon broke ground on the Black Cultural Center. Um, absolutely. So despite what um, other people might think and might say, and it doesn't mean that bad things don't happen, good things do happen. This Black Cultural Center is being designed not just for black people, it's being designed for faculty, students, and staff who want to engage with the black experience. And if you look at the history of Oregon, despite what we know about some of the unsavory aspects of its past, there have been a majority of people who actually have wanted to engage with the black experience and with black people. And so I think things are positive. And I think that it's important that we get together and try to make um, this dictum, this notion that the Panthers tried to pass on, that there is actually power in the people. And so I say to you, power to the people. Thank you very much.